Hello, my name is Andrew Goetz. I'm a chief resident at Mayo Clinic. Today we will be discussing diagnostic sialendoscopy for recurrent sialadenitis. This is in the absence of stones. Patients typically present with one or more salivary glands involved, and this is often postprandial or after eating with swelling, pain, redness, and irritation. This may or may not be in the setting of other inflammatory disorders such as Sjogren's syndrome or medications that induce xerostomia or dry mouth. These patients typically start with conservative management, including massage, use of sialagogues, warm compresses, and occasional antibiotics and steroids. However, some patients continue to progress and become symptomatic, and sialendoscopy can be both diagnostic as well as therapeutic in this setting as dilation of the salivary gland with identification of any strictures or constriction points, as well as irrigation out of the gland and installation of steroids can be very helpful. Imaging in these patients can be helpful to evaluate for stones or masses or other causes of obstruction, but often in the case of recurrent sialadenitis, they may show no abnormalities or simply chronic changes within the salivary gland or inflammatory changes in the setting of an acute inflammatory event. Sialendoscopy can be performed in awake patients with a bit of local anesthetic. In these cases, we will show it under general anesthesia. A few helpful tips include hydrating the patient in the preoperative area, particularly if they have been fasting for a long period of time. This can be done with adding a liter saline bolus in the preop area. The use of ketamine as part of their anesthetic can also be helpful as this medication has a side effect of sialuria, which can be helpful in the setting of sialendoscopy to better identify the salivary gland papilla. First, we will discuss cannulation and dilation of the parotid duct using the serial dilation technique with lacrimal probes. The parotid duct opening is quite reliable within the buccal mucosa and it opens into the mouth opposite the second upper molar. The non-dominant hand should be used to put the buccal mucosa on tension with gentle retraction anteriorly and laterally, and the papilla should be visualized. We tend to do this under loop visualization. However, the use of a microscope is also commonly done. Once the papilla is visualized, cannulation proceeds with engaging the opening. I like to do this with simply the weight of the lacrimal probe providing the pressure in order to reduce the risk of perforation. As you can see here, the duct is now cannulated. And then serial dilation occurs with increasing the size of the lacrimal probe. Here you can see the use of the conical dilator once you've dilated up to um, a certain extent where you can visualize the opening. The conical dilator can help finish the dilation and you're prepared for introduction of the silendoscope or if you prefer the use of a sheath, you may place a sheath at this time and then the silendoscope afterward. Next, we'll discuss the use of the guide wire and Seldinger technique for cannulation and dilation of the submandibular duct. The submandibular duct opening is more variable than the parotid duct, but in general, this opens into a narrow opening at the summit of the small papilla termed the sublingual caruncle at the side of the frenulum of the tongue. This can be in any orientation at the tip of this caruncle. And it's important to note that the most anterior duct is going to be the submandibular duct, as several papilla may be present from the sublingual ducts as well. Placing tension on the submandibular papilla is helpful. Here used a tooth curved forceps, and then the guide wire is used to feel along and engage the opening and then it is passed gently in order to prevent perforation. This is generally in a inferior and lateral direction as seen here. At this point, once the guide wire is placed, it's relatively simple to dilate up the duct with serial dilations. These introducer kits come with disposable dilators in several sizes, uh, increasing in diameter each time. In deciding which technique to employ, I generally follow this rule of thumb. If with loop magnification, I'm able to visualize the papilla with free-flowing saliva, then I'll use the lacrimal probe dilators serially, as this will be more easy to cannulate. If I'm unable to see that, particularly in patients who've had scarring or are profoundly xerostomic and don't have much saliva flow, I tend to use the guide wire technique with 
the Seldinger technique for dilation as the cannulation of these ducts can be quite challenging. It's also important to note that in published studies, 6% of salivary ducts are unable to be cannulated. This is an important point for preoperative counseling of the patient. And then if one is electing to use the camera sheath, you can place the sheath here as seen with the blue sheath and then the camera can go in and out and the sheath can remain in place. I often like to not use the sheath and simply put the camera in and out of the papilla as it's easily visualized at this point and the sheath requires one extra thing that can uh, become misaligned and make it a bit more challenging. Once the papilla is dilated, you are ready to use the sile endoscope. Here you see the setup similar to a sinus case with the screen forward in order for visualization and your assistant providing constant saline irrigation in order to open the duct and also irrigate out any debris within the duct. It is important to optimize your view of the sile endoscope. Orient the sile endoscope as well as fine tune the focus. I tend to do this using my glove and the letterings on the glove. You then introduce the sile endoscope into the papilla and the key here is being able to visualize the lumen and keep the lumen in the center. The non-dominant hand is often providing a lot of the traction and changing the counter traction will change the view with the sile endoscope, making the dominant hand holding the scope in some ways even less important than the counter traction provided with your non-dominant hand on the cheek in the case of a parotid or in the floor of mouth in the case of a submandibular sile endoscopy. The course of the duct should be examined for any strictures or sludge or thickened secretions and irrigation should be ongoing during the procedure. And my recommendation is that you use the largest sile endoscope that you think you'll be able to place into the duct. Some people think that the 0.89 millimeter sile endoscope will be easier to use because it's the smallest. However, I find that visualization is limited with the smaller scopes. Therefore, a 1.1 or 1.3 sile endoscope for a diagnostic sile endoscopy is my preference. Displayed here is a relatively normal parotid duct, and as you get closer to the end, you start to see the branches of the parotid duct. There are no stones and not a particularly high burden of sludge in this case. At the conclusion, generally a steroid is infused through the parotid or submandibular duct system. Here we're using Kenalog. Several steroids have been described. This can be placed simply with an angiocath directly into the duct papilla, or it can be irrigated through the sile endoscope itself. Key points of sile endoscopy include a strong foundational knowledge of anatomy and the expected course of the ducts of the salivary glands in order to optimize the likelihood of cannulation. Adjunct measures include bolusing the patient in the pre-op area, use of ketamine during the procedure, and if the patient's awake, use of vitamin C tablets, all in order to promote salivary flow and increase the likelihood of visualization of the duct and cannulation. As with many surgeries, countertension is critical. For the parotid duct, use of your non-dominant hand to provide anterior and lateral traction on the buccal mucosa is essential. And then once cannulated, the trajectory of the cannulation should be out and slightly superior in the case of the submandibular gland, the countertension can be provided with a curved tooth forceps or with countertension in the floor of mouth with the non-dominant hand. Magnification in the form of loops, exoscopes, or a microscope is essential for successful cannulation and dilation of the very small duct papilla. In general, I like to use a slightly larger sile endoscope. The 1.1 and 1.3 millimeter sile endoscopes are a good workhorse for diagnostic sile endoscopy with the 1.6 sile endoscope particularly helpful for interventional sile endoscopy. The sile endoscopy equipment is extremely fragile and should be handled with great care in order to reduce the risk of fracture of your lenses, which is a costly repair. This concludes the video on diagnostic sile endoscopy. Thank you for watching.